So welcome um, to those of you, and new friends and old friends, joining us again for our Tuesday series, um, Tuesdays at Trzitzky. Today we have a, a special treat. We have Pascal Bastien, who is a former student and longtime uh, volunteer, benefactor of the Institute, um, and a practicing uh, internal, do we call you an inter internal medic? Uh, internist might be the shortest. Internist, okay, internist. Some things are above my pay grade. He will explain what all of that is. Uh, who is also uh, quite a theologian in his own right, as well as a composer, an arranger, and a man of many gifts. And uh, so, But today his brief is to share with us a topic of, of um, imminent and pressing concern. And uh, so without further ado, I'll allow Pascal to, to take over. And uh, he will also field his own questions, I think, at the end for the best way to handle this. Thank you so much for being given. Thank you very much for, for having me today. Um, I, uh, I, real I realize that there's a solid audience, so I, I'm sure that you'll make sure to keep me on, on, uh, on track. Um, I uh, couldn't help but, uh, after having my wife review my first slide, realize that I probably had to apologize for the somewhat pedantic title that she found quite silly. Um, that's probably my failed attempt to try to live up to the, uh, the expectations of an Eastern Christian to throw in some Greek in there. It's also uh, maybe a, an immediate uh, hint of the fact that terminology and words are, are quite important in, in any conversation around this topic around euthanasia uh, because good words have come to mean very bad things, certainly. Um, and uh, then of course maybe a, a tiny uh, pun uh, on, on the fact that of course the uh, maid has uh, if we were to call it that, which I don't recommend we do, uh, has uh, definitely made its appearance in Canada, kind of become uh, one of the, the, the foremost uh, proponents and, and promoters of uh, euthanasia around the world. Um, and so, of course, my, my objective is to give a, a Christian outlook on this question, uh, this difficult question uh, that tackles us. We should first, of course, understand what is happening around us, and uh, hopefully, maybe in a, in a secondary phase, which I will not totally be, I will only be hinting at towards the end of my talk, uh, thinking of the, the response that uh, Christians should have in this context. Um, but there's a lot to be said about actually simply what has happened. In medicine, we, all, we like to start our talks by having a list of objectives at the beginning of any uh, talk, so perhaps this is not, a, this is not something that physicians uh, do on, on their own. So the, the objectives are, are listed here. The, we'll review the, the terminology used in, in, in euthanasia. We'll contextualize it to the Canadian context. We'll try to go through some of the, the main steps that have uh, led to the, the legalization um, and the various laws and college regulations that exist in the country and uh, in the various provinces. We will try to understand how uh, the, the Canadian Medical Association, uh, which is a, an associ a national association of physicians, has been handling this question, how it has interacted with its international counterparts. Um, as I alluded to, how each provincial college has decided to legislate this internally uh, we will uh, explore this question of access to care versus freedom of conscience because these two are often pitted uh, against each other as though they had to be. We'll explore how uh, valid that, uh, that assertion might be. We will talk about what the future of medicine and palliative care might be like in Canada. Uh, and uh, I will, you know, as a layman, uh, try to, to hint as, as to what um, Christians should, should be doing as a response uh, to, to the situation, although there are many people in the room who might be uh, in an even more uh, authoritative position to answer that question, I will nonetheless uh, try to give some ideas. The, um, th so I, as I was alluding to, I, I think that terminology is a big problem, and, you, uh, and the fact is people can be using some very good words uh, that have been uh, turned into a, a very awful direction, and so if we only listen to the words, we may actually like what we hear, uh, but we have to listen more closely if, what if they have come to mean. So euthanasia, of course, euthanatos, as I was alluding to in the original title, simply comes from the Greek good death. And of course, there's nothing non-Christian but good, get, good death, and I would argue there's probably no human being on earth who doesn't want euthanatos. Um, naturally, as it has come to mean the intentional killing or ending of one's life, it has taken on a very particular meaning. Um, in Canada, specifically euthanasia, or what historically may have been also been known as voluntary euthanasia, is now to be described as clinician-administered medical assistance in dying, or perhaps even uh, better, clinician-administered MAID, because acronyms also make their appearance, acronyms kind of further numb us to the reality that we are describing. 
uh, physician assisted suicide as opposed to euthanasia is the uh, provision to a patient of the medication that they in turn will be using on themselves. So unlike euthanasia where the physician and their, the nurses and the, the healthcare team members may administer the lethal substances to a patient, in physician assisted suicide they simply give them the medications which they can then go on to use maybe after having uh, you know, looked at the stars on a nice mountain and uh, ending things on their own with the medical assistance of course of the physicians. Um, and as I alluded to, the, the acronym MADE, of course, has, has surfaced uh, and allows people to be even more distanced from, um, from what they're doing. The term DEATH used to be used in various uh, nomenclature. It has been removed by dying because, again, death is seemingly more harsh to the ear than a vague process of dying. Uh, the, um, there are more confusing terms uh, that I want to, to allude to. So, um, in my brief conversation with uh, Father Jeffrey at the beginning, uh, when, when he first arrived, we, we alluded to this, the fact that passive and active euthanasia are terms that used to be used. Uh, that is certainly not something that Christians should want because it creates a terrible confusion between something that is clearly uh, allowing a natural process to take, take place, and which uh, we, we do in, in palliative context all the time. You do not have to go on a ventilator uh, at the end of life, when you're in respiratory failure, which at, at one point will always be in cardiorespiratory failure, that's universal to all human deaths, uh, you do not have a moral obligation to go and try to prolong that by minutes or hours or days and going on, to, on a ventilator. Uh, and yet, the, the, so the idea here is that the, the lack of use of these things or the cessation of use of these very extreme or extraordinary measures are not in fact at all an intentional killing, uh, even though they may have been called in the past passive euthanasia. Allowing a natural process to take place is not, it should not be understood as euthanasia or as used to be called active euthanasia. Active euthanasia is, the, is not allowing a natural process to take place, it's replacing the natural process with a new process which is intentionally bringing the end of a human life. Uh, and so you can see how if we lump the two together, as the proponents of euthanasia have done historically, we create this blurry line between, well, we're just going from passive euthanasia to active euthanasia. At the end, there's death anyway. So what difference is there? Well, at the end of all of our lives, there's going to be death. And really, I would argue the only thing we, that is, in fact, in our control is how we choose to live our lives. And so there's a big difference, in fact, between whether you're intentionally ending someone's life or allowing a natural dying process to take place. Uh, palliative care, of course, is fully Catholic, it's fully Christian. Um, the, the, um, the, the, these are, these are uh, quotes taken from various uh, documents, which I, I didn't leave the, the, the reference to, but I think one of them is a direct quote from uh, an encyclical letter from, from uh, John Paul II. The, so, we have no duty to initiate life prolonging procedures that are insufficiently beneficial or excessively burdensome. Uh, procedures or medications that are intended to alleviate symptoms are morally acceptable despite potentials to hasten death. And that's just to emphasize the fact that uh, the, the, the traditional understanding of uh, palliative care is in keeping with, with church teaching. Naturally, you have to understand that anything that we would be doing here uh, is never intended to cause death. We accept that when administering medications that m are used in order to alleviate physical pain or shortness of breath, you know, if we think of opioids, for example, medications like morphine, we are using them in as low as possible doses in order to achieve the desired goal, which is to remove the, the terrible sense of breathlessness or re remove terrible sense of physical pain. We, are, we know that there may be uh, an impact on uh, respiratory drive and so on, but in fact, there are also good studies in the palliative care field that show that cautious use of, a good use of palliative care may actually prolong life. So, even though we, we do accept a theoretical risk that uh, palliative care could at times shorten the duration of life, when you decrease the amount of, uh, of, of distress in a patient, you bring down their metabolic rate, and you may therefore actually paradoxically increase their life even numerically. And so the, the, um, even quantitatively, the, the, this concern doesn't necessarily pan out. But it's important to, to, I think from a moral level, the intention of the action is clearly uh, very important. The greatest uh, 
misuse of terms that I would like to, to cast your eyes upon is this notion of dying with dignity, which of course is the very name of, uh, of the um, greatest uh, proponent uh, or advocate of euthanasia and all its related uh, procedures in Canada and in many other countries. Dying with dignity is a, should be perceived by Christians as an enormous insult and affront a, a, a to uh, our belief mm -hmm. because it takes the word dignity, which uh, has a very good and holy meaning, and it completely replaces it. I, I left here an icon of the Good Samaritan. You can understand that clearly the uh, Good Samaritan had inherent dignity. If you look, however, at the Samaritan with the eyes of dying with dignity, this, this pro-euthanasia association, you might think that instead of the Good Samaritan, who is actually depicted in this icon as Christ himself, uh, rubbing his wounds with oil and curing him, we might we'd be better off simply to off him and make him go to the next world. Uh, this is obviously not our understanding of Christian dignity. People who are drooling in their beds have di dignity inherent to, the, to the, their human nature, uh, and it is not by putting them in the grave that we, we make that dignity come, come forth. Christ on the cross himself, I have to uh, also bring to your attention, could not be looked at as someone with dignity with that uh, skewed or deformed understanding of human dignity. Naturally, we as Christians look at Christ hanging on the cross as the, 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 the summit uh, of, of any time in, in human history. We cannot possibly look at Christ there as lacking dignity. Uh, our, our ideological uh, opponents would, of course, say that it would be much better for him to be quickly zapped out, and we cannot accept that either. So take-home message number one, for those of you taking notes. <laughs> the debate around euthanasia largely hinges on false and misleading terminology. I think this is very important. Euthanasia and assisted suicide, which, by the way, would be the two terms that I would encourage people to use as opposed to buying into terms like made, which I think are... Uh, would be uh, contaminating our own speech. Uh, while used to end suffering are forms of willful killing. And I think it's important to call a spade a spade in order to avoid confusion. A little bit of a quick history of euthanasia. So in Gre Greco-Roman times, uh, you're probably familiar with the fact that euthanasia was around and, and it was accepted. Uh, interestingly, Hippocrates, uh, whose oath is, is very famous today, uh, took a stance against it and actually encouraged physicians working in his tradition to avoid getting uh, engaging in it. And there is no necessary connection between medicine and ending lives. In fact, it is much more complicated to, uh, pres to heal and preserve life than it is to kill people. There is a fairly simple science and probably a crash course of a few minutes that you would need to learn how to eliminate uh, people, how to kill people, how to euthanize them. And there's actually no need for this to be uh, provided, quote-unquote, by physicians. And in Greek times, for the large part, it wasn't. Um, the more modern history of euthanasia came back with uh, elements of, um, of uh, certainly Nazi euthanasia. Uh, and even in the U.S., with movements of social Darwinism, became quite popular in the 1930s. On the right here is a uh, hospital or a euthanasia center uh, that, under the Third Reich, was very active known as the Hartheim Euthanasia Center, where 18,000 people were killed during the Third Reich. Now, of course, th these were non-voluntary uh, elements of euthanasia, but there's certainly a connection with the, the return to this as being some, uh, something that uh, discredits traditional morality and embraces a solution as a means to, quote-unquote, help society. The geography of euthanasia before 2016 looked like this. So there are three neighboring countries of Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg, that are in the tiny little red spot in Europe, and then Colombia had actually some uh, euthanasia laws that were passed in the 1990s. So very, very few countries until you bring in Canada, actually. Uh, so there, Colombia, 1997. The Netherlands in 2001 legalized euthanasia for adults. 2004 for children. In Belgium, 2002 for adults. 2013 for children. And Luxembourg in 2009. When Canada joins the map, suddenly, you know, Canada kind of puts euthanasia on the map, so to speak, uh, certainly in terms of the, the, the amount of color on the screen, but also because Canada had a, a, maybe a, a more, uh, please join us, had, had maybe more moral authority on the world scene. Uh, and um, the, the, 
this is not something that happened, uh, you know, coincidentally in 2016. The Canadian uh, identity has has uh, been evolving, and I, I won't get into politics. Certainly, I'm actually not very interested in politics myself. Um, but I, I have to allude to a few of the the elements. Sorry, a few of the elements that have um, uh, touched upon this or, or led to this. I will just make a little bracket here and say that while in red we saw here the countries that have legalized euthanasia, there's a few other jurisdictions that have legalized physician-assisted suicide, and so a number of states in the U.S., uh, Vermont, uh, on, on, in the East Coast, and then California, Oregon, and so on, Hawaii, actually, that you can see, but you can probably not guess that it's green, uh, and Germany, as well as Switzerland. Switzerland, which is the only place in the world where non- and uh, um, non-native or not, non people who are not who don't have the, the nationality are allowed to come in and, and basically do euthanasia or physician assisted suicide tourism, uh, which is why a number of Canadians and Americans and so on have gone to Switzerland for this reason. Uh, this here is not directly related to euthanasia, but it is related to the fact that the, the there is a very clear desire. Uh, for Canada to take on this kind of new moral role on the world scene to promote its values. Um, and so I, I will not describe, I will not suggest today that there is a direct connection or uh, an exact connection between euthanasia, there's certainly a connection in my mind, but not maybe not, not a, a, an immediate connection between euthanasia and abortion. But some of these sentences are quite interesting. By the way, The Lancet is essentially one of two major medical journals. There's at least one medical student in the room who I, I, I can, uh, I'm sure will agree with me. Um, the New England Journal of Medicine and The Lancet are the two main English language and, in fact, overall uh, medical journals in the world. And so the fact that The Lancet, in 2018, decided to publish an entire, uh, an entire paper on the question of Canadian health and gave three pages to our Prime Minister, another two, three pages to our Minister of Justice is interesting. And the topic that was chosen by our Prime Minister in that article was specifically what Canada wishes to promote on the world scene in terms of its you know, superior progressive ethics. And so uh, the, uh, we, we learn in it that at uh, the heart of the, this policy, the Canadian policy of 650 million, we will be, over three years, addressing gaps in sexual and reproductive health and rights. Now, translated into real language, that means 650 million towards, uh, certainly to some extent, uh, promotion of, of condoms and so on, but for, in large part, generating access throughout the world to abortions, to women who would not have abortions otherwise. Um, the, um, and we read here, and I think it's worth reading out loud, it is unacceptable that they are subject, he's talking about the, the world in general, and see the things he loves together. They, the women of the world, are subject to female genital mutilation, forced into early marriage, make victims of sexual and gender-based violence, and, really very much in the same vein, unable to freely and safely access abortion. There are no excuses for such practices. Women and adolescents must have free choice in matters of their own sexual and reproductive health. And so Canada is going very strongly promoting its, its new views and wanting to impose it on the world. This doesn't end. I, I was, uh, it doesn't end with uh, with a, uh, women's rights, as they're called uh, commonly. It also extends to euthanasia. So the Canadian Medical Association, which I alluded to, is the body that represents Canadian physicians, mm -hmm. participates in something called the uh, World Medical Medical Association, and they just met last month in Reykjavik, actually. And some of you may have heard about this. One of our uh, certainly one Christian uh, physician friend of mine went to Reykjavik. And in it, uh, Canada tried to generate more and more interest for this idea that euthanasia is wonderful and wanted to change the uh, medical, or sorry, the bioethics code of the World Medical Association to remove any language that is negative towards people who perform euthanasia. Because currently, the WMA's code of ethics condemns euthanasia as something that physicians should not engage in. And so they kind of made this, uh, they, they tag team with a, a team from the Netherlands and they we're going to bring a motion, but they quickly realized that they weren't going to get enough traction to have this passed. And the Canadians got very frustrated and eventually found an excuse uh, by any objective observer to basically leave and quit the WMA altogether. And so without consulting any Canadian physicians, the three people that represented the Canadian Medical Association in Reykjavik decided to uh, remove Canada from the WMA. 
And the reason that they found was that the guy who wrote the speech for the new president of the WMA had actually committed plagiarism. He had used some quotes from the internet that he had found. And based on the fact that this guy, whose English is like fourth language, he's an Israeli uh, physician, based on the fact that his speech had con was containing some segments of plagiarism, they said, clearly, this is an unethical uh, organization. We therefore must withdraw ourselves from uh, this organization. And we're supposed to take them seriously. And they refused, even after a challenge a few weeks in, the, the, the head of the CMA and so on, uh, hold to their word that this was the reason why Canada withdrew. Anyone who was there will tell you, no, they had been boiling for two days beforehand. They were yelling in the hallways and so on. They were extremely angry that no one was buying to the whole idea that euthanasia is wonderful. Uh, and of course, they see that as judgment. No one likes to be told that what they're doing is wrong. And so they left stomping their feet. Take home message number two. Canada is leading, leading the promotion of progressive values on the world scene. This, is now, uh, this now officially includes euthanasia and assisted suicide, uh, which of course we, are, we should not refer to as the right to die according to one's desire. It's understood as such anyway. The, we have to talk about why, of course, this is becoming uh, so important to people to, to, um, to turn to, towards euthanasia as this new quote-unquote right. And we have to ask ourselves, why not before? Because the great mystery is that medicine was actually not in a position to address suffering in any real way until recently. And palliative care has actually done such enormous progress, has, uh, has made leaps and bounds. We have to ask ourselves, why now and why not before? when in these 17th and 18th century hospitals, people would be yelling for days on end without any hope of, uh, of an end in their suffering, sometimes until the, the, the bitter end, or in the rare cases where some uh, operation or rare medication worked towards their healing. And part of that, of course, has to do with the fact that uh, they approach suffering and approach their human existence in a completely different mind frame and it's that mind frame that has changed. It is not the, uh, it's not the medicine. But it is very, very uh, paradoxical. A, I can tell you that when we hear stories that try to promote euthanasia, many of the stories that you'll hear are about terrible physical suffering, terrible pain, terrible shortness of breath. And at the hospital where I work, at Northrop General Hospital, I will tell you, most of my colleagues, whether they have some vague Jewish background, some vague Western European background and maybe somewhere along the line had Christian ancestors, the vast majority of my colleagues are either agnostic or atheist. But they know medicine quite well. They know medicine very well. And they don't buy for one second that kind of rhetoric. We know that with good palliative care, and at North York General Hospital we have a very good palliative care team, physical suffering can be addressed extremely efficiently. There is no reason why physical suffering couldn't be titrated and essentially removed. But that does not take away all the actual problem, and there is still a drive for euthanasia. The, what's important to understand is that it's not physical pain, it's not shortness of breath, and I'll try to give you an idea as to what that might be. This here is a quote uh, from the Golden Mail on the right. Miss Rodriguez had had access to excellent palliative care in the early 1990s, but she didn't want to succumb to the, to the administrations of others. She wanted to live until she decided it was time to die, and she wanted to do it quickly, and while she was still lucid. Palliative care can dull the pain and sedate you into unconsciousness. It can sometimes actually take care of the pain without sedating you, but anyway. But it can't give you control or choice, if it's true. And that is what Mrs. Rodriguez wanted. Okay. We're here because there's a culture war. We're here because people do not understand their own humanity in the same way as their forefathers and foremothers. We, we're here because we are approaching life with a narcissistic and agnostic humanistic approach which doesn't have any, which doesn't find any meaning in suffering, in human suffering certainly, and which simply strives to uh, maximize uh, comfort, maximize pleasure, minimize suffering, and certainly has uh, a great deal to do with the desire for control, as for Mrs. Rodriguez. Take home message number three, the push for euthanasia does not stem, stem from uncontrolled physical suffering. That is objectively better controlled than ever before in human history, thanks to advances in palliative care. The push for euthanasia stems from a subjective loss of self-worth, a desire for control, sorrow, 
fear, and shame. And different people will be in slightly different situations. The, the main proponents, people who are willing to go in you know, on the news and fight cases like the Carter case, probably more of the former uh, reasons, and some of the uh, old grandmothers who are completely lonely and abandoned and feel like they're a burden on society, some of the louder uh, elements. And there are more of those than of the former. We're going to uh, study this, the quick steps uh, to legalization. I'll mention that I've only been a practicing physician for a bit more than six years now, and when I finished my residency training in 2012, there was no sign of euthanasia being a real thing. I was very happy to be in a field where I could practice as a Christian and not really have any moral qualms. That was very short-lived, I will admit. Um, and I would, uh, you know, I was not particularly hoping to be uh, in an area where I would be confronted with, with uh, challenges. I'd be much happier talking to you today about, you know, some great um, medical mission uh, in, in Africa or somewhere where we're spreading the, the gospel. But that's not where God is calling me right now. Um, and so let's go, just go through how the landscape has changed so quickly uh, in the span of just a few years. So in 2014, Quebec, independent from the rest of the country, uh, sorry, that's maybe a le if there are lawyers in the room, they'll recognize that that's actually not correct. I wrote that, and then the reality is that criminal law is under the federal governance, I gather. But the 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 um, everything that has to do with medicine and uh, education, but medicine is, is the governed at the provincial level. So the Quebec refined its healthcare laws and included euthanasia within it. And so even though the criminal code was banning euthanasia. Their loophole was to say, well, no, this is actually not really part of the, shouldn't be part of the criminal code, it should be part of the healthcare laws, and so we will declare that this is actually legal in that sense. That was going to take place, or take effect in 2015, but before it even took effect, in February 2015, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled on the Carter case, and in Carter versus Canada, it was determined that physicians may provide euthanasia or assisted suicide for competent adults who clearly consent, who have a grievous and irremediable medical condition, including illness, disease, or disability, that causes uh, enduring and intolerable physical or psychological suffering, and that cannot be relieved by means acceptable to the individual, which means if you don't want to have palliative care, that's just not acceptable to you. If you don't want to take morphine, that's really unacceptable to you you may decline any type of conventional care for your symptoms simply by stating that it's not acceptable. The criteria defined by Carter are actually quite a bit broader than they had been in the Quebec statute. Carter was to take place or materialize one year later but because it was taking too long for the government. Four months, if I remember correctly, were added so that it would actually materialize only in June 2016. During that time, uh, I'm sure a number of lawyers were busy amending and correcting, improving the Canadian Common Law Criminal Code. Um, and so the criminal, criminal Code states that the natural death of the candidate must be reasonably foreseeable, completely vague and undefined, and replicates Quebec's requirement of an advanced state of decline, which also is extremely subjective. It also specifies that the candidate's illness, disease, or disability be incurable. I'll add that everyone in this room suffers from an incurable disease by virtue of being alive. The moment you were, con you know, even before you were born, when you're still just conceived in your mother's womb, you had a terminal disease, uncurable. You will die. So I don't know what that means. June 17, 2016, euthanasia became legal. And uh, if it hadn't been happening before, which some of us certainly feel that it was, numbers starting to be collected of legal euthanasias in the country. So this is the first year of euthanasia in Canada. Sorry that the font is quite small. There were 803 uh, cases of euthanasia in Canada between June 17th and December 31st, 2016. So in about half a year, 800 cases. And then between January 1st and June 30th, the next half year, almost 1,200. And between December 10th, 2015, which includes the Quebec cases, and June 30th, 2017, a bit more than 2,000, okay? If your reflexes, that's not a lot, but that's not a good reflex. Uh, and know that it is rising, the, the, the rate at which these are happening, of course, rising. These were very, in, in, in some round, they were brave people, the first people who jumped in. Um, 
as the as it's becoming more and more commonplace, uh, that more and more people are feeling comfortable with the idea of jumping in. In 2016, something else was happening, uh, increasing pressure for Carter Plus. And you have to believe that like, a lot of this is political. A lot of this is manipulation of, of uh, political opinion. And so while at first the government, I think, was very intentional about uh, showing themselves taking some kind of very reasonable modern ground and saying, well, okay, we're not, we're going to, yes, of course, euthanasia is this wonderful thing, but we in Canada won't be euthanizing children, or we in Canada won't be euthanizing people with mental health disease, you know, kind of problematic when the DSM-4, which determines mental health, sees suicide as a problem that ought to be cured if you suddenly tell people with mental health problems that when they want suicide, we're going to assist them, it kind of like puts the entire the book on its head. Um, the, uh, so th this very, um, this initial decision was to find a common ground, but of course it didn't uh, totally wet the appetite, uh, or sorry, or once the appetite has been wetted, if that's the proper conjugation, uh, then people will want more, and that's exactly what's happening. So the, uh, the government opened, uh, opened itself to, to more and more um, advisors in terms of how they should potentially broaden their law. And if you have been reading the newspaper for the last two years, you can find ample example. This is very much just to illustrate it is not exhaustive. The Globe and Mail, Sandra Martin writes in April 2017, Canada's assisted dying laws must be open to those with mental illness. Okay. National Post very recently, I think this is from within a month ago, Toronto Sick Kid Hospital preparing policy for euthanasia for youth over 18 that could one day apply to minors. And so of course, if you're 18 years old and it's sick kids, you may already be euthanized, but you have to understand that in medicine and in science, anything that will get your name out there is kind of nice. So if I can be the first one to publish a case series of 10 cases of euthanized children in Canada, that gets my name and the board. But like, and I'm not exaggerating, like there is, there is true appetite to be the first at doing these groundbreaking things, and they are groundbreaking things. Uh, and so, there's, there's this appetite, basically like, as soon as it's legal, we're ready, like we've got it prepared. This is what the people at Sick Kids are telling us. Their bioethicists have helped them come up with these strategies, and the physicians uh, behind it have you know, created the necessary protocols, weight-based dosing of medications they need to use, they're ready to go. Uh, CDC Radio tells us about an Ontario man with dementia on crusade to plan his own death, the issue for people with dementia. If you haven't um, fully grasped it, is that if uh, you if you're not in a position, to, if you if you are no longer capable, if you're no longer deemed capable by virtue of your cognitive decline in Canada currently, you may not receive euthanasia because you cannot defer it to a substitute decision maker. So in medicine in general, if you come to the hospital unconscious or too ill to make decisions for yourself, there is a certain uh, series of steps. If you have a legal power of attorney, we go to your power of attorney for medical decision making. If you do not have a legal power of attorney, we go to your spouse. If you have one, we go to your parents, to your children, your you know, first degree relative, second degree relative. There's a certain series of, of steps. But in no cases at this point can we use substitute, substitute decision makers to uh, decide for euthanasia right now. Big problem if you suffer if you're thinking I suffer from dementia and in a few months in a few years I may not be able to ask for it. You are there. So this man who is in the early stage of dementia is saying no no no. There must be a way for my loved ones to eventually make the decision for me that I can be euthanized. Otherwise I'm going to be stuck and I don't want to be stuck. And evoking our Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom, our, our charter, uh, there are lawsuits underway in British Columbia and in Quebec currently that assert the requirements are unconstitu unconstitutional uh, and deny some patients of this right, this right to die. Take home message number four. Once you buy into euthanasia, you can't have, have enough of it. Indeed, if good, why keep it for the few? And uh, you have to acknowledge that once you see euthanasia as a good thing, which I will certainly postulate is an enormous mistake, why, how could you argue that you shouldn't spread it? We, we all believe that when we hold a good thing, we should share it with our friends. That's what people who love euthanasia want to do. And uh, the only way to convince them otherwise is to convince them that it's not actually good for them or anyone else. Why not share it with people with non-terminal disease? Why not share it with people with mental health disease? Why not bring it to children? And why not allow, allow substitute decision makers to opt for it? 
especially that people who can no longer make decisions for themselves in the uh, materialistic eyes of our times actually probably are seen as having less value. And so if anyone ought to be euthanized, one might argue with that mind frame, it would be those people. Again, I have to be, make it very clear, I do not believe this. How did the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario respond? So of course the medical, uh, medical assistance in Zion quickly got its own policy and there was of course no resistance at all to generate a nice uh, ironed out policy in Ontario as to how we were going to legislate it. And so that was produced very quickly, it was perfectly in time for the uh, legislation that came out of the Carter. So you can see in June 2016, approved by council, this was ready. No surprise there. The surprise is this one. And uh, those of you who have been reading in the, a lot on the topic may already be aware, but some of you may not be, and so I have to emphasize this point. In Ontario, uh, about a year before euthanasia became legal, the College of Physicians and Surgeons came out and said, anything that is legal in this country, in this province, physicians ought to either perform themselves, or if they are not equipped, uh, if it's not in their area of expertise, or if somehow they have a religious or conscience objection to it, they must then refer in an urgent fashion to a non-objecting physician. I think I may have left the exact text here for us. So there you go. So where physicians are unwilling to provide certain elements of care for reasons of conscience or religion, an effective referral to another healthcare provider must be provided to the patient. An effective referral means a referral made in good faith to a non-objecting, available and accessible physician, other healthcare pro professional or agency. The referral must be made in a timely manner to allow patients to access care. And of course, as the uh, engrenage, as the cogwheels on the right are there to remind us, that is completely impossible. This is not a form of uh, accommodation for conscience. Because if I tell a nurse to go and give my patient a lethal drug, or if I tell my colleague, physician, please arrange for my patient to receive a lethal drug from your nurse, I am a cogwheel on that system just the same. When I send my patient to see a general surgeon to have a surgery on their abdomen because there's a mass, it's because I believe that the removal of that mass is likely of benefit to my patient. I would not send my patient to have a major surgery if I believe that was harmful to them. It would be wrong for me to send a referral to a colleague to do a procedure that is wrong. There is a moral judgment that accompanies necessarily the referral. That is why actually there is a need for a referral. Otherwise, you would just, that, that's actually why in Canada you don't go straight into the you know, subspecialist office. You go first to your primary care provider. They determine, based on their, uh, their professional uh, opinion, whether such a referral is needed, or they might gu guide you in a different direction. So then the question is, like, is it just that the CPSO has a very different understanding of what referrals mean? Maybe, they, maybe they, what I'm saying here is like directly out of the catechism and, and is not understood by the CPSO. So forgive me for talking about this totally unpleasant and seemingly unrelated topic of female genital mutilation, but it has the advantage of having moral, uh, moral consent by people who promote euthanasia and by ourselves as Christians. And so let me just show you what the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario says in its policy on female genital mutilation, okay? So it tells us, physicians in Ontario must not perform any FGC slash M, okay, i.e. these horrendous procedures where a clitoris or other body part may be chopped off. Further, physicians must not refer patients to any person for the performance of FGC slash M procedures. The performance of or referral for these procedures by a physician will be regarded by the college as professional misconduct. And if this is the case, it is clearly because the college of course understands, as I think all of you do in the room, that the referral has an implication of ascension to a certain procedure. And so you simply cannot tell a conscientious object, you cannot tell someone who believes that euthanasia is wrong, who believes euthanasia is murder, don't worry. You don't have to euthanize the patient yourself. You just need to give them an effective referral to your non-objecting colleague in a timely fashion so that he or she will euthanize them. This is very important because Ontario actually stands alone with PEI in the world. In this regard where we have simultaneously, sorry, I went to my next slide, which is interesting as well. But there is no other jurisdiction in the world where we have simultaneously euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide and a college that states you must refer. 
if I were a Belgian physician, if I were a, Fre uh, sorry, a Swiss physician, and I was, as I am, objecting to perform these, I would be allowed to simply tell my patient, while I acknowledge your right to seek this, and while I'm perfectly willing to accompany you explore other options, such as palliative care, for example, if you are set in your ways and you insist that this is the only uh, avenue that you would like to pursue, I will have to respectfully step back and I cannot accompany you down that path. I would be allowed to do that in Belgium. If I say those words in Canada, and I will be saying them, I put myself at risk of losing my license with the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, and once that happens, I simply cannot practice medicine in this province anymore. And I'm not saying that to uh, ask for your sympathy, I say it to uh, raise some alarm that this is the state of medicine in your province, in my province. Shortly before this 2015 policy, there was all this scandal going on in Quebec around uh, the, uh, the visible um, signs, uh, visible religious signs. And Lake Ridge Health, which is a hospital in, in Oshawa, decided to put out ads to attract people from Quebec and encourage them to come. And they said, we don't care what's on your head. And that's actually a pretty powerful ad. If you look at that, like if I were a Muslim working as a nurse or a doctor in Quebec and I wanted to wear my hijab, I would be like, well, okay, Ontario is a welcoming place. I can be a Muslim and come to uh, Ontario. <clears throat> the problem is the following. The CPSO doesn't care what's on your head either. <laughs> they just want to make sure you'll ignore what's inside. And I, you know, I came up with this, like, I found this little picture on the web. That would be my little poster, and I don't know who's going to want to put it, but this is a very, very troubling reality, that in Ontario, we might be very comfortable with visible signs of religion. We have people, you know, a very close colleague of mine, a good friend, uh, one of my most religious friends is a Sikh, and he has his turban and a very long beard, and he would, ha he would have issues in Quebec. He can practice in Ontario. But in Ontario, despite his turban and his long beard, if a patient demands that he be referred for euthanasia, my Sikh colleague has to refer him, just like I, a Christian physician, have to refer him. And there's absolutely no, nothing to protect us. We have no leg to stand on when we say no. We can hope that the patients won't, you know, by being compassionate and being sympathetic, and we can hope that our patients, the patients won't make a formal complaint to the college and bring this to their attention. But if they're at all intended on getting rid of us, and certainly people within the college seem to have a desire to quote unquote cleanse the profession, they would be within their rights, and we have no like to stand on. There was a number of um, Christian physicians, mostly uh, I think three Catholic physicians from Ottawa, and then the um, the Catholic Federation of Catholic Physicians and the um, Christian uh, Medical Dental Society that teamed up uh, for a court challenge to the CPSO policy using the same Charter of Rights, which professes freedom of conscience and religion, and uh, asked Ontario to review whether it was in fact in keeping with our uh, rights as Ontarians to have this CPSO policy. And this went to pro the provincial level, and the provincial level ruled back in uh, January of this year, and the conclusion was doctors who objected treatment on moral grounds must give referral. But that, uh, so the court actually did pronounce itself at the provincial level and said, yes, we believe that the CPSO struck a nice balance between access to care and physician conscious rights. And because we don't want physicians to quote unquote impose their religious views on their patients, this is a reasonable middle ground. This is now being challenged and likely will end up in the Supreme Court of Canada. Take home message, which I think is number five. <clears throat> Ontario is in a unique position where its physicians are subject both to policies on mandatory referral and laws that have permitted euthanasia. In the span of one year, euthanasia went from being punishable by the criminal, Canadian Criminal Code to a medical procedure for which Ontario physicians must provide referrals. Which in itself, if you spend a minute thinking about it, is also quite astonishing. Uh, or moving forward. The main reason why our opponents have been able to push this agenda forward is because of this notion of access to care. And if you can convince people that on one hand you have these doctors who are holding a position which is contrary to what the law now states and who are in this power of authority, and then you have the innocent patient who is suffering, granted, and is in a position 
to seek euthanasia, you can easily create a situation where you don't want the uh, self-righteous physician to impose their views on the suffering patient. And this is exactly the strategy that has been used. I'll argue, however, that this is a false dichotomy, that it is not one or the other. And very paradoxically, that Christian physicians have contributed to a system which in the end did not solve their problems. Um, the Tronco Sun, which I think we will all recognize as an ultra-conservative, super uh, traditional, uh, no, okay, no, I'm not serious. Right. People were not laughing, so I have to like, no, so, but even the Toronto Sun wrote around this time, why is Ontario forcing docs to participate in euthanasia? The, the question is an important one. And th so this writer was saying, doctors who oppose euthanasia aren't saying that patients aren't entitled to a medically assisted death, only that they not be required to make effective referrals by having a government phone number they can give their patients instead. The government should grant this perfectly reasonable request. And so indeed, groups of Christian physicians that I belong to lobbied that this be implemented. So we were saying, it is not true that this is the only way. Mandatory, we, we don't need to all drink the Kool-Aid. You can still get access to everyone that you want to have euthanasia. Create this phone number that therefore doesn't, because the, the scenario that you're presented with, like, okay, but what if you make a home visit, a patient calls you, you make a home visit, and they can't even walk anywhere, and they ask for euthanasia, and you're the only one there, and then you, because you're self-righteous, say no to them, they're going to be stuck because of your stubbornness. And so we don't want that to happen. So it's okay. But if the patient is capable of calling anyone into their home, they're capable of phoning a main number. And I actually have, and my colleagues and I who have discussed this, I have no qualms about saying like, the number exists. Of course, euthanasia is legal in this country. I'm not trying to hide the truth. And I'm willing to say the number is this one. I would never tell you to call it. I think it would be a huge mistake to call it. But I'm actually, I do, I do not, there's no moral uh, responsibility in me saying, yes, there is such a number. And you can access it on, you know, Canada, if you Google Canada euthanasia number or Ontario euthanasia number, here it is. That's not morally binding. I cannot give you a referral which says, I, can, I assent to this. I think this is good for you. I can never say that because I don't believe it to be true. So here's the paradox. Such a number was created in every province, but Ontario didn't drop the requirements for mandatory referral. Right? So officially, you no longer need a physician at all to get you in line for euthanasia. You can simply call this number, 1-866-286-4023, in French and English, here are the hours. But still, if a physician encounters a patient, letting them know that this number exists wouldn't suffice. You would still have fallen short according to the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, of your professional obligations for having not provided a referral, an effective referral, to a non-injecting physician in a timely fashion. Take home message number five. Those who promote mandatory referral and who pit access to care against physicians' conscience rights are not interested in access to care, which has been achieved through provincial care coordination service phone numbers. They are interested in ideological hegemony. What is the future in Ontario and in Canada of faith-based health institutions? Here we read in January 2018, Global News, an article I took some quotes here for us. Over 18 months, 37 Albertans have been denied, denied their rights at faith-based health centres and had to be transferred to another facility to follow through on their request. You know, some people in Alberta who belong to a long-term care facility run by nuns, we have some nuns in the room, and the nuns simply said, no, we can't euthanize you. If you want that to happen, you would have to go elsewhere. Well, that's completely unacceptable in the eyes of our uh, enlightened Canadian society. It's a situation that has raised questions around the future of faith-based hospitals in the province. So the core issue is whether they should be getting government funding in the case where they refuse to comply with government policy. These are Canadian laws. They're not playing with Canadian rules. Maybe they shouldn't get any dollars from us. Of course, this completely omits the fact that there's, I don't know, uh, you know, what's the proportion of Catholics in this country who are paying taxes? These dollars come from somewhere. They come largely, you know, 25, 30, 40 percent of Canadians are Christians, but that's not important. Mm -hmm. Canada has de determined that the, la the laws say this is good, and so if you don't play by those games, you shouldn't, you shouldn't get a penny. There may not, you know, there's going to be a very hard future for faith-based institutions in this country. Uh, and this is happening in every province, it's not just in Alberta, of course. What's the future of palliative care? 
I can tell you that pro-life positions are under rising pressure to conform. And of course, many of them are stubborn like I am and are not going to conform. Uh, but they're going to be, uh, for, you know, they might not be able to have teaching positions uh, in various palliative care programs. If you're a medical student or resident and you are interested in palliative care, number one, you would have to be extremely brave. It would be uh, the type of bravery that would be required for a medical student right now to be interested in OBGYN. Try to enter an OBGYN program in Canada when you're a practicing Christian you're going to run into enormous trouble. It had happened maybe a handful of times in the last decade, as far as I know, and usually because people had no idea. The same will become true, I fear, unless we can change the tide um, in palliative care. And of course, the new generation of palliative care physicians are trained not in traditional palliative care, but with the mind frame that we are offering various services that range, yes, from giving you perfectly acceptable comfort uh, treatment for your shortness of breath, for your pain, and accompanying you in the dying process, to offering you death right now. And I became alarmed when I saw that the same palliative care physicians that I had been referring to my patients to over the last six years, who work in the hospital simply, and are part of a, uh, you know, a team of palliative care doctors that I, I, I don't refer to a specific physician, I call the service, and the service comes and whoever's on that day sees my patient. But I'm getting these letters back. And I'm hearing that my, you know, 89-year-old lady from Goa, who is, uh, you know, cradle Catholic, and who is dying of cancer, has been offered euthanasia in that first encounter with the palliative care doctors because it's on the menu. And the fact that it's, you know, completely insulting to her to hear that is not important because this is not about being patient-centered. It's about having this menu and having these wonderful rights put above all uh, common sense. I would say. What is the future of medicine? I don't know how many of you in the room know Udo Schuklenk, but if we're going to name our enemies, Udo Schuklenk, if you were here, would, will it, would I think accept the fact that I would describe him as an enemy of anyone who fights for life. Uh, Udo Schuklenk is an extremely aggressive bioethicist. He uh, is the uh, Ontario Research Chair in Bioethics. That tells you something about academic bioethics nowadays. He's out of Queens. And so he's written tons of articles, or well, he's been quoted in numerous articles over the last few years. So he's very uh, candid. He says, ban conscientious objection by Canadian doctors. Prospective physicians who oppose abortion or assisted death should not be allowed into medical school. Those who let conscientious objection affect patient care are clearly unprofessional. Uh, so it says Udo Shukang and his co-author, because they wrote a book together, Julian Savulescu. I'm coming close to the end, and I think I... So thank you for your, your attention for almost an hour. Um, the I won't quiz you in the room. I think those of you with an Eastern background will probably recognize the saint as, whose icon is there. Uh, this is Saint Pantelemon. Saint Pantelemon was a early Christian saint. He is part of a group of uh, saints known as the Holy and Mercenaries. He's not holding a very modern blister pack, but something similar to that. There's a bunch of medication in the little box there, representing the icon. Uh, and so, I, or, you know, you can get those nowadays. They have like Monday, Tuesday, AM, PM. Uh, they look a little different in the second century. Um, and so he was martyred at very, in the very early third century uh, for the common reasons of the time, for not uh, accepting to worship uh, the emperor. It was very, uh, the, the, the true stairway to heaven, the song forgets to tell us, was really just be a Christian in uh, you know, the, the early church. Um, and he had a rough time, but he gives us a very clear sign of, of fortitude and courage, which is scary, but helpful to us. Uh, if the blood of martyrs is the seeds of the church, then let us Christians not buckle at the risk of losing job and prestige and becoming conscientious objectors. Compared to lions and other things that early Christians had to face, it shouldn't be that scary. Maintaining a Christian presence in the field of medicine, of course, is an uphill but necessary battle, and I hope you will agree with me. When I speak to some people, they want me to highlight uh, some of the good things that are happening, and I do not want to underestimate their importance, but I also do not think that the solutions will be political. So you, if you want to be encouraged, do know that there is a, uh, a politician out west in Saskatchewan who, who uh, placed this bill, Protection of Freedom uh, Conscious Act. This is a private member's bill, and it was placed in the course of the last month. 
And of course, this is a Christian MP who is doing this because he recognizes how important it is to have conscience rights uh, upheld. But as the openparliament.ca website tells you, private members' bills don't often become law. And other similar bills have been put forward, forward in the last two years and nothing has come of them. And I don't think that much will come of this. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, naturally, it is the right thing. If you're a politician, doing this is the right thing. But the real problem is not a political problem. It's a problem of conversion. It's the problem that people no longer understand why life is important. And people need to experience a conversion. People belong to a culture that is a culture of death. And we, as Christians, need to present them with a culture of life that will empower them to see what is, in fact, better. It is by attracting them to something better that their heart can be changed. It is by presenting people with something better than euthanasia that their hearts can be changed. Not necessarily by coercing politicians to sign something that they don't see as the, the most important thing. What are we to do as Christian physicians? So I think the, fir the first thing, I go back to this icon of the Good Samaritan. The first thing is that we need to continue doing exactly what we're, we're supposed to do with, with the suffering. And if we are, yes, as physicians and healthcare workers, embracing the care and doing it as Christ would do unto others, this will be a very first good step in the right direction. And if Christian physicians, and, and I say this as a sinner, live their, their professional life uh, as good examples, it, it becomes much harder to then, you know, it, to, to, to push us out of the profession. Hopefully that would cre create some kind of resistance. Um, but this is not only for physicians. There, there, there are implications for all of us. And uh, In my last slide, I, I will allude to that briefly. I think it's very important for people to be formed. Uh, and again, in, in the brief time that we chatted, Father Jeffrey was saying, whether uh, Catholic or Orthodox, whether Protestant, so many people misunderstand this, these questions, don't know the difference between palliative care, maybe in euthanasia, think that perhaps any type of comfort care is necessarily bad, uh, or conversely, that, you know, why is the church making a fuss about this? This is clearly, people should be allowed to choose these things. Uh, it, it's, to me, it's, it's very much the same thing that happened 30 years ago with, with abortion. People don't necessarily understand what they're talking about. Um, and because our enemies are well organized and use words that have a different meaning, they, they, can, they can easily command that. So people should be formed, they should understand the natural law, they should be reminded of the commandments. And again, not simply by rote memorization that thou shalt not kill, but understanding the implications will resonate with their hearts. Um, because those laws are, are, are written in their hearts. We should, of course, go back to Holy Scripture. In 1 Corinthians, we read, Do not, do not forget that that your, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit that God put there. Uh, for, you were, for you're not your own, but you were bought at a price. You know? And I mean, that's just one of, of so many elements of the scripture. But the more, we are, the more we are complete Christians, the more it will be easy to, to defend ourselves against these lies. The Catechism, of course, would help us as well. Um, we can be encouraged in a way. I, I went in my university years, <clears throat> those who know me well know that I was not always a very devout uh, Christian. But, <clears throat> so sorry, I'm getting emotional. I'm be strong. Uh, in my, um, it, even in my times of doubt about you know, numerous theological questions, I could never get myself to believe that it would be okay to kill fetuses or babies. And in this case, adult human beings, because that went against everything that I believed. And it's actually encouraging to know that really the only people who stand for life right now are Christians, with maybe a few exceptions. But one has to ask herself, why is it that only Christians are standing up right now and fighting this battle? That's actually a great uh, sense of encouragement in our faith. And I think we should not be uh, trying to, to celebrate that. As church communities, we have to do much more, we have to be much more intentional about reaching out to the sick who need love, attention, prayer, and spiritual support. So many people are extremely lonely uh, and, again, are not going to get all the help and attention they need from their doctor who spends maybe 10 minutes in their room, maybe less than that, maybe a bit more than that, but certainly who will not bring them all the comfort that they need. 
And that loneliness that the modern healthcare system leaves them in, leaves them in is often the main source of suffering that no amount of opioids, no amount of shortness of breath and pain therapy will remove. If they do not have uh, an attachment to their life, uh, human connections that reminds them of the, the, their value, they themselves will cease to, to believe it. Matthew 25, and in it we read, and maybe I have my cheat sheet, but for I was hungry and you gave me food, I was thirsty and you gave me drink, I was in prison and you came to me, I was sick and you visited me. And I thought that was interesting because if I was writing that, I was, I was sick and you cured me. But our Lord knows that not every disease in this world can be cured. Our Lord doesn't say, I was sick and you cured me. He said, I was sick and you visited me. And, and that's very important to me because I really believe that the main problem that behind the, the, the suffering of the people who are and, when I'm asking for euthanasia is a tremendous sense of loneliness and loss of sense of worth. And it can happen to people who are isolated, who don't belong to our church communities, and I think we should be thinking about fixing that. It certainly happens also to people who belong to Christian communities. I can think of a woman, who of course I will not name, at Northrop General Hospital, who's been hospitalized for more than six months and who belongs to a church community. And people show up, maybe on Sundays after church, they come and visit her and they spend an hour or two and that's, that, that, that's remarkable, that's more than I do for my fellow Christians. But that leaves her six days a week in darkness. And a few weeks ago, there was a rumor that she was asking for euthanasia. Fortunately, I went to her bedside, we chatted, and I think it was a gross misunderstanding. She, she was implying she would not, no longer want a, a very aggressive care and would be open to letting nature take its course. But, that's, but, but, but she admitted to me in that conversation, it, it all boiled down to the fact that she was so tremendously lonely. And it, even if for her it didn't go all the way to asking to be, I think the same human elements are, are to be present. And we have to do more if we're going to fight the, this, this uh, increasing passion for, for euthanasia. I want to finish with one little passage from the Catechism of the Ukrainian, the Ukrainian Catholic Church. The Roman Church, of course, has its own catechism. The only Eastern Church that has a catechism, I think, is the Ukrainian Catholic Church. The Sorry? The Marinette's have one. The Marinette's have one. Okay, so there's one of two Eastern Catholic catechism. And in it, um, the, the, um, there are three points on euthanasia. And if you allow me, I will finish with those and I'll, I'll, I'll take any questions that you have. Okay. The, chur the Church teaches, nothing and no one can in any way permit the killing of innocent human beings, whether fetus or an embryo, an infant or an adult, an old person, or one suffering from an incurable disease or a person who is dying. Furthermore, no one is permitted to ask for this act of killing, either for himself or herself, or for another person entrusted to his or her care, nor can he or she consent to it, either explicitly or implicitly. Nor can any authority legitimately recommend or permit such an action, for it is a question of the violation of the divine law, an offense against the dignity of the human person, a crime against life, and an attack on humanity. Sometimes, because of prolonged and unbearable pain, people may ask for death for themselves or for another. However, such pleas for death are not always a manifestation of a true desire for assisted suicide or euthanasia. In reality, the gravely ill person needs love, attention, prayer, and spiritual support. Those who are close to the infirm, parents, children, family members, friends, and also doctors, nurses, clergy, and other members of the church community are called to surround the infirm with such care. Thank you very much. I th it was a brilliant presentation. You, you gave us a lot of information in an hour. You are to be commended for that. Uh, a very technical question, I suppose, that this challenge that might be going to the Supreme Court, was the argument already made at the provincial court level that you gave here? In other words, that policies of the college actually contradict each other? Was that used in the argumentation, or is that something that could yet be brought forward to the Supreme Court of Canada? Or what's your understanding of that? Because that seems to me to be patently obvious that that's a contradiction, that they've hoist themselves on their own petard. But so, it, yeah. so I can tell, I was not present at, at uh, the court proceedings, but I can tell you that the, this idea is not my own. 
uh, I was not the one to dig up this um, this policy on uh, female genital mutilation, which fortunately is really never used. Um, but it was identified as people who are very much, very active, and uh, and so I have no doubt that the lawyers involved are nice perfectly aware of this. Um, even the people at college are aware of this blatant contradiction, and in fact, uh, I was surprised to see that the college is in the midst of a revision of this and two other policies, uh, and are in the process of getting rid of such policies, uh, probably in one, one sense to try to clean up their act and make it more coherent, uh, but of course in a quest for co coherence they will of course keep the new policies and remove the old, and in a general sense to move away from any kind of moral judgment, that basically as though the physicians as a profession were not to be in a position to make moral judgments on anything, but rather become just these technicians to implement state laws, which actually, in my opinion, removes any sense of profession. We would then become, uh, you know, technical operators, but we are not a profession if we are not to have any kind of moral stance on anything. Um, and so there, there seems to be a shift at the college level away from any uh, moral judgment. And if one day, of course, Ontario was to decide to make female genital mutilation a good thing, then suddenly we would be expected to apply that and refer for that, because why not? Yes, sister. Dr. Bassett, I want to thank you very much for such an a presentation that really laid out the challenge that we're up against, you know, in this pro-life struggle. That's another dimension to the pro-life struggle. You know, it is a sad fact that a lot of the decision making in our <coughs> world today is driven by money. Now, you didn't touch on that aspect in your presentation. You spoke a lot about rights. So I was wondering if you can address the financial undercurrents to this particular issue. Sure. So, uh, I was asked that question before, uh, uh, but uh, in a recent talk at the Newman College, uh, Newman Center, sorry, but um, I guess my, my honest answer is that I, I think that anyone in government, anyone in policy um, realizes what you're saying and is rubbing their fingers behind closed doors or rubbing their hands behind closed doors. I don't think that's what the re I do not think it is the reason why these laws are able to pass so easily. Because the average Canadian gives their assent to this notion on the premise of these being rights and on this, on this idea that we have put autonomy on the altar and we are worshipping this, this autonomy above all else. I think that's what gets you going politically. I think that's why, there, that's why there's traction to this idea. The rest is this great benefit that, of course, in our crumbling healthcare system, uh, that is not sustainable, and Ontario has the largest subnational debt, largely being driven by uh, the, the, our healthcare system. It's a great news that we can now get rid of more and more elderly and people whose care would all otherwise be uh, costly. Um, I, I, so I know it's in people's heart. I do, I don't think that it's the, dr the, the the I don't think it's what is allowing it to become politically viable. Even though I think in the politician, politicians' hearts it's a, a great uh, collateral gain. Mm -hmm. That's my personal opinion, of course. None of this is public, of course. Mm -hmm. So two more questions? Oh, go ahead. Um, it's my understanding that suicide was once illegal, just the act of suicide. I have to believe that that policy was implemented because of an underlying sense of values in our, uh, our country, which are, I suspect were based on Christian values. At what point was suicide made legal, just the act of suicide, but was it done in conjunction with this new policy? That, that, do you sure. happen to know what the history there is? And it would be interesting to look at parliamentary debates around sure. original illegality of suicide. So I guess uh, I would defer that question to the lawyer, so I don't know the answer directly to that question. I suppose I, as a non-legal expert, I have to wonder how you punish, even in the old days, how you punish suicide uh, after it's been completed. But maybe Kyle has a... You punish it that you don't get your life insurance uh, ah. payouts. It's mm. a crime. Ah, well, there you go. And so, mm. so I don't know... I, I, so but that's I, if it's written in the policy. Yeah, that's right. It's that's a contractual right. provision that's right. of the policy. And there, was, there are cases that that's were right. litigated on that. And you no, also I can't think you can't hold your back. It's what mm. the consequence to the 
the person who's successfully committed attempted suicide, maybe there could be a punishment, but there is no punishment for suicide because the perpetrator is gone. You <laughs> attempted suicide would be going to an asylum probably. Attempted suicide could have some But also you can't aid or abet somebody in a crime. So that, and that's, that's true, also which is why the prohibition yeah. uh, for doctors to aid, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. that was the prohibition in the criminal code that has been removed, that a doctor mm. cannot assist. And as soon as you're helping, I suppose, anyone to kill someone, even if it's themselves, like clearly, it, it's no longer your contribution is no longer sui. It's still suicidal, but it's not sui. So, <laughs> for, for, then it's more from a career standpoint. It becomes homicidal. Like I helped kill someone else who wanted to be killed, maybe. But they, yeah. So I mean, I, I, I don't know how. I don't know what uh, the, the steps were if there were any previous laws. Or, but I can tell you that certainly in medicine, uh, suicidal thoughts, suicidal ideation, as we we uh, say, is seen as part of the diagnostic criteria for depression, for example. And is seen as an evil that sh sh is seen as pathological and pushes us to use, for example, medication to undo that harm, which is seen as a no, uh, you know, chemical imbalance in the brain. Clearly, if we're going to start legalizing mm -hmm. euthanasia for people with mental health, as they are already doing in the Netherlands and Belgium and so on, psychiatrists are going to have to come up with some kind of an explanation. Like, how do you determine which, which depressed person who seeks... Uh, who is suicidal ought to be helped and which depressed person who is suicidal ought to be inhibited and given medication to get their negative uh, cognitive function or, or um, brain chemistry back on track. Sorry, I'm obviously speaking outside of my area, area you know, neurotransmitter or not. Are you, you're not going to be a psychiatrist, are you? You're, so you won't, you won't judge me. Okay. Uh, so uh, maybe one here and then back. Just the uh, one question. Um, you talked about that um, the Ontario College of Physicians have said that if a physician uh, recommends uh, suicide, that it's professional misconduct. In the... In, they don't recommend. Well, they don't recommend. Okay. So, in a situation like at Northrop General, um, let's say that a person is has a terminal disease, as you said, and uh, is in cognitive uh, form and wants to... Um, have assisted suicide, but as you say, you have to refer it to somebody. Mm -hmm. In that situation, what happens at like at a hospital? Because they are in a hospital, and so they call this number and they say, "Well, you know, I'm going to die. We, we're all going to die." But what happens in that situation? Yeah. So I mean, it's, uh, and well, that's very relevant to, to my practice because that's where I work. I, I have a strict to hospital-based practice at Northern General, uh, and I spend maybe a third of my time looking after inpatients. Uh, Hospitals, the hospital, the hospital clinics, and so on. Um, and so I've come across a few situations at the personal level where, where I've had conversations that touched on it. A few uh, more happened just before legalization, making my life e easy, so to speak. But obviously, that's just coincidence. And, and, uh, and I, I, I go to work with the knowledge that any day could be a day that I wear a mask, pinpoint that, that question. The reality is that no matter how you spin it, a patient who is in the situation to ask for euthanasia should know their options and so I don't mean to, to, to be a cop-out but I truly believe they need to know what kind of care has to offer them and so I can follow my conscience I, I like I can tell them about palliative care to a certain uh, to a certain degree but as a specialist in general internal medicine I'm not fully the expert on palliative care and so for the purpose of allowing them to explore palliative care, I'm comfortable consulting my palliative care colleagues. Mm -hmm. The problem is that I know that uh, it's a roll of the dice. Some of my palliative care colleagues are people who perform euthanasia and will have no problem going in that path, down that path with them. So it's a bit of a double edge. Like in order to allow them to explore fully their options, mm -hmm. I need palliative care, but I know that by bringing them on. So, so the problem I think right, is, and so I, and maybe there's a moral theologian who's going to tell me that I'm wrong, but I, I do, I, I would consult the, the palliative care doctors. I would spend much more time with that patient trying to explore at the personal level to allow them to tease out where the, the, the problems are in the hope to encourage them in the right direction. And perhaps because I'm not fully comfortable with what they might hear from someone else, but I still need to give them a full test of good palliative care, otherwise to give them an, an alternative. The real crux 
comes for primary palliative care doctors right now, and there are good Christian palliative care doctors, there are good Orthodox Jewish palliative care doctors who cannot in good conscience uh, perform the euthanasia or refer to their next door neighbor in palliative care who does it. It's a, it, it's a bit of a, an atrocity that palliative care has inherited this as part of their work. I, I, I truly believe it should have been you know, ideal. Non even in a world where euthanasia is seen as necessary, give it to non-physicians, give it, it, it soils the, the, the discipline of medicine, it soils the discipline of palliative care. But anyway, to answer your question, I think the, 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 the real problem comes right now for the palliative care doctor. But again, I think someone who would be out to get me would still be able to say like, no, no, but I want you to refer me specifically to that. I'd be like, no, I can't do that. So, if someone's out to get me, they can get me. Yes? It's a segue into this question as well. You mentioned that. You said at one point that uh, Christian, Christians are the only face that are kind of standing up against this. I would argue that there's liberal sections of the faith that, that don't necessarily sure. agree with you. And, um, but in your work, and you've already mentioned one, I was just wondering, there's got to be other faiths that are standing up to this. And you mentioned the Orthodox Jewish, but what about the Islamic? I'm not, I'm yeah, totally yeah. So, where do they, Sikhs, where do they stand on this? Yeah. So, I, so I, I mentioned. So again, so I think that I, I would hold to what um, to what I said in, in terms of any kind of organized um, defense. At the individual level, what you're saying is absolutely correct, uh, and I would say that there, you know, I know of at least one non-religious, self-declared secular humanist physician. I'm going to be remain vague and maybe not. I was going to describe what the work she does. Um, who is also fighting this and very much uh, try, trying to prevent this from happening. And in the level of conscience objection, there are many of my colleagues, many of my atheist colleagues are, that I've had conversation with, would stand up in court and fight for conscience, uh, conscience rights for physicians. They preach, you know, you can hardly be a Jewish physician and not believe that the Nuremberg trial had something good to say. And so clearly, you can't always stand behind the fact that something is legal to say that you can go ahead and do it. If we judge the, the Nazis and the Nuremberg trial, to give a quick uh, recap of history here for those who may have forgotten what these are, people who committed Nazi atrocities while following the laws of the Third Reich were still con condemned in an international court afterwards because they did things that were considered completely atrocious and that any human should know not to do. And so you can't always hide behind the laws of the country, and the laws of the country are not supreme. Like, there's a general understanding of that. And so my colleagues are perfectly willing to say, yeah, like, while I have no problem with euthanasia, I totally agree with you, Pascal. It's completely ridiculous to expect that physicians would remove their conscience when they come in the door. And like, do you want a doctor who has removed his or her conscience uh, when they come to work? Well, most people would say, no, they don't want that kind of a doctor. Um, so, but to, to go back to your, to your question, um, uh, I would maybe, so I, I would totally agree. I have heard of Muslim physicians who also uh, are opposed to this. They have not been, uh, you know, writing about. Like I've not met them personally, but like friends of friends, uh, definitely. I uh, my my uh, devout Sikh colleague would tell me that he disagrees with it, but I don't think in his case um, he would have a, a moral theology backbone to assist him in a cohesive fight against this. And so I, I think in the end, I, I kind of my my understanding is that he would probably just play along with what he's expected to do, truly thinking that it's wrong. He would never ask for it for himself. He would tell family members of his who asked for it that they shouldn't, but he wouldn't lead a crusade against it to try to change the laws and so on. Um, and I think that's not because his uh, conscience isn't on the right track. I think in the contrary, his conscience is very much on the right track, but because maybe there isn't the same kind of history of moral theology in Sikhism, and I say that admittedly ignorant uh, on tape, uh, but um, that's that's my understanding. But yes, I, and and, like, and like maybe just to reemphasize, it is specifically that because I believe that this is so deeply rooted in natural law, that I expect, in fact, that people from all backgrounds, religious or perhaps even not religious, would agree with us. This is something that, that you certainly do not have to believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, which nonetheless we believe as Christians. Uh, to, to believe this. And I would certainly say that while it is, and I'm going to say this again on camera, uh, while it is true that there might be Christians who say, oh yes, I'm Christian, and yet I think euthanasia is wonderful, or abortion is wonderful, I would uh, question the sincerity of their first statement. 
I'm so sorry. Thank you for an ladies first, ladies last. Extraordinary presentation on this topic, and I've seen many over the last couple of years. Two, two points. Where do we go from here? Um, do we do we formulate some sort of ministry? I, I mean, you talked about love, attention, prayer, and spiritual support is what is needed. Do we form some sort of ministry that focuses on on providing those? You know. So many people now are either don't have family or don't have family in the same city. They live on the other side of the world. It's, it's just the way that society, you know, we've evolved. So do we as a church actually become the love, you know, form, form a ministry? Um, in terms of the, you know, the politics and changing the law, I don't think we can rely on that. Do we, put, do we advocate for more money to go into palliative care? Because my understanding is that the availability of palliative care in Ontario is is limited. Mm -hmm. Do we put more money into advocate, you know, ask the government to put our tax money, those of us who don't believe in killing patients, should our tax money be directed to uh, a system that actually provides palliative care? You know, where, where do we go from here? Because the situation is... I don't think we can rely on the courts. No, I, I, and, <laughs> and perhaps you can share with everyone that you, you know a thing or two about courts. Um, so the um, the real, so as a Christian, primarily, what comes to mind is the, the fact that I think every church, every parish, should think do do a, a you know community examination of conscience, thing like what are we do? Are we doing everything we can as a church to go visit the sick? And so some of these things, which I think traditionally had been encouraged in the church, are simply not lived out. If, as a prof young professional or less young professional in this city, you have not visited a sick person other than, you know, your first degree relatives in the last year, that might be something that is worth examining. And I said, like, outside of my own patients, which are in my profession, I have not done that. And I, recently a colleague and I were speaking, like, that's not right. We should probably be go visiting patients who are not ours in our own time as part of this type of ministry. And I think every single church or parish that belongs to a tradition where life is upheld should be doing this. Because there is tons of these elderly patients, primarily elderly, right, who come from retirement homes, long-term care facilities, where they're already alone. And then they come sick and suffering to hospital. And there's just despair in their heart. Um, and we cannot expect only the Sisters of Life and other religious orders to go and visit them. And that's not... Partly because our religious orders are not as numerous as they used to be. We we're going to pray that they become more numerous. But anyway, every Christian, whether you're called to uh, a life uh, as a monk, a nun, or a priest, every Christian is called to live out Matthew 25. No, And so I, I think that's probably first and foremost. And if really we were to take that seriously, I think that would already send the world such a powerful message of hope. Um, one of the reasons why I think Mother Teresa, when it came to the abortion uh, questions, was, was so respected by her opponents, was the fact that she would tell people, if you don't want them, I will take them. And she meant it. And people knew she meant it. And you can't argue with that. So, you know. so, I won't run for applause. Let's go. <laughs>